This week, as I was reading through the Gospel accounts of the resurrection of Jesus, I was struck by a statement in John chapter 20 and verse 9, which tells us that the disciples did not yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. And I started to think about that little word, must, or had to. And I, I don't always give a title to my message, but um, my title is this. It had to happen, or did it? And all will be revealed as we go along. So I found myself asking, why didn't the disciples understand? What was the scripture that John was referring to? And why did Jesus have to rise from the dead? And that's the main theme of the message. So we'll deal with the first two questions fairly quickly before trying to answer the third one. All right. Why didn't they understand? I'm just going to give you four reasons, four possibilities, which seem to me to make sense. I think three of them we can be sure of, um, one of them maybe not. And I'm not going to discuss them in, at all. I'm just going to throw them out there for you to think about. There are some things we don't understand until after they have happened. Their minds were clouded by unbelief. It was just too good to be true. Jesus had not yet opened their minds to understand the scriptures. It's a reference to Luke 24, 45. And they hadn't yet received the Holy Spirit who would guide them into all the truth. John 16, 13. So there are some reasons perhaps why they didn't understand. But we'll move on. What was the scripture John was referring to? They did not understand yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. What scripture? Now, it's clear from Acts 2, verses 24 to 32, that Peter, having been filled with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, now understood, here's the reference to the Holy Spirit and understanding, he now understood Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11, to be a clear prophecy that Jesus would rise from the dead. He says in verse 24, it's Acts 2, 24, that God raised Jesus from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was not possible for death to keep its hold on him. And quoting where the psalm says, my body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Peter applies that directly to the resurrection of Jesus, saying in verse 31 that David saw what was ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. So maybe that was the scripture John's referring to. But of course, there are many other Old Testament passages, which we're not going into today, which prophesy the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, notably Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. But we can't be sure exactly what scripture John had in mind, because he doesn't tell us. What we do know is that Jesus himself had explained to his disciples that, and I quote, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Matthew 16, 21, Mark 8, 31, Luke 9, 22, all referring to the same incident. But notice that these verses not only say that he must be raised to life, but also that he must suffer and be killed. 
So that now widens our question from why did Jesus have to rise from the dead to why did Jesus have to suffer and die and rise from the dead? Why must he suffer and die in the first place? I'm going to give you two reasons, though I, I did actually start off with four, but I've simplified it down to two, and somebody afterwards is probably going to ask me what the other two were. <laughs> and I shall say, think about it for yourself. <laughs> All right. Firstly, because the scripture must be fulfilled. And secondly, because it was the only way that we could be saved. First then, the scripture must be fulfilled. The New Testament is full of this, constantly saying the scripture must be fulfilled. This had to happen because. Um, Matthew has at least 10 fulfillment sayings. This happened to fulfill which was spoken by the prophet saying. At least 10 times Matthew does that. Trying to show his Jewish readers that Jesus was the Messiah. Hmm. But... Um, Put yourself now in the Garden of Gethsemane just before Jesus died. They're coming to arrest him. And uh, Peter, isn't it, takes a sword and cuts off the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest. And Jesus says, there's no need to do that. <laughs> Puts the ear back on. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but he says... Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legion of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? The scriptures say it must happen. Therefore, it must happen. Get a hold of that. That's, that's something to apply in your everyday life. If the scripture says it must happen, it must. Now go to the road to Emmaus after Jesus has risen from the dead and he's talking to those two disciples. Luke 24 verses 25 to 27. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Didn't the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Notice there a reference to suffering, but also to resurrection implicit in enter his glory, which is actually beyond the resurrection. But the resurrection had to come first. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. The scriptures had to be fulfilled. And in the same passage, but now verses 44 to 47, he says to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. I'm not sure that that bit was what was recorded in the scripture about preaching to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And there are hints of that kind of thing in the Old Testament. But um, certainly Jesus perhaps is moving on. The Christ had to suffer because that's what's written. He had to rise from the dead because that's what's happened. And now what you've got to do, do is go and preach repentance and forgiveness of sins to all nations. More of that a bit later on. Now why are these references to the fulfilment of scripture so important? Because what God says in the Bible must come to pass. He said, let there be light. It was his word. He said it. And there was light. 
What he says happens. Jesus had to rise from the dead because the, in the Bible God said he would. We've also seen that it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Why? Because he was God's holy one. He will not suffer your holy one to see corruption. Jesus is the only man who ever lived a sinless life. God's holy one. And the wages of sin is death. Death is the result of sin. Jesus didn't die as a result of sin. He gave up his life voluntarily. How wonderful. But because he was the spotless son of God, he was raised from the dead according to the scripture. But why did Jesus have to suffer and die? Now, we'll go to that in a moment, and the New Testament gives us clear reasons for this. But before we come to it, we need to think about the words had to and what they mean in this context. My title was, It Had to Happen, or Did It? Hmm. Did he really have to die? Didn't he have a choice about it? Yes, he did. Notice what he said in John 10, verses 17 to 18. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up. This command I have received from my father. So Jesus didn't have to suffer and die. He had a choice about it. He laid it down of his own accord. But before man ever sinned, he voluntarily chose to do so because he loved us. You say, before man ever sinned? Yes, before the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain. Knowing that man would sin, knowing that man would need a saviour, Jesus had already expressed his willingness to die. Oh, yes. See, he knew that if he chose not to, and in a sense, he could have chosen not to, there would be no hope for us. The only way to save us from the just punishment of our sins deserve was to take that punishment for us by dying on the cross. So in Gethsemane, when he says, nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want, He's ratifying the decision that he made before the world began. I will go through with this. He knew he must suffer. He knew he must die. It was the only way that we could be saved. <coughs> so let's explore that a little bit further. Let me explain it like this. Because God loves us, he wants what's best for us. Because he knows what's best for us, he sets boundaries for our actions. I was thinking of a human parent. Now, I think most human parents want what's best for their children. Generally speaking, they know what's best for their children. But maybe not always. But with God, he not only wants what's best for his children, he quite categorically knows what's best for us. 
And so, because he knows what's best for us, he sets boundaries for our actions. And if we go beyond those boundaries, there can be serious consequences. The shocking news this week about the bridge in Baltimore that collapsed because a vessel yeah. collided with it. Yeah. <sighs> I imagine that as soon as it happened, they erected a no entry sign to prevent traffic crossing the bridge. Would you agree that's probably what they must have done? If anyone ignored that no entry sign, it could have been fatal. How many times have you ignored a road close sign? <laughs> well, they're so badly displayed that I must confess I often have. But you know, no entry is a bit different. That's a clear prohibition. No entry. And you go through a no entry sign and you could be dead. You don't know what the reason is for the no entry. But those who put it there do. And so it is with God. No entry signs like you shall not kill you shall not steal. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not lie. Are all there for a good reason. God gives us those no entry signs for our good because he loves us. And the Bible has a word for God's no entry signs or for ignoring God's no entry signs and that word is sin see if we disobey those signs there's a price to pay the consequences could be very serious <coughs> and the Bible says that it applies to all of us Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 1 Kings 8, 46 says, there is no one who does not sin. And 1 John 1, 8 says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the Bible warns us of the seriousness of sin. It separates us from God, who is holy. Isaiah says, our sins have hidden his face from us. And unless our sins are dealt with, our separation from God will be eternal. That's how serious it is. It's Jesus himself who talked about eternal punishment. Matthew 25, 46. We may not like it, but he said it. And Paul tells us that the price we pay for our sin is death. The penalty. The fine, if you like. A bit more than a traffic infringement. Going through a no entry sign. <coughs> God's no entry signs are much more serious than that. The price we pay for sin is death. So sin is serious. It separates from God and there's nothing we can do about it. We cannot hide it, for our sin will find us out. Numbers 32, 23. We can't cleanse ourselves from it. Turning over a new leaf today won't eradicate yesterday's sin. It's still there. Do you, do you remember getting a new exercise book at school? And uh, some of you are old enough like me to remember when we actually wrote with ink. Um, well, <laughs> when I was at primary school, it was those dip pens that you put in ink wells and you uh, monitor went round and filled up all the ink wells every morning and you then dipped your pen in and you, you had to... 
write as neatly as you could. And we had blotting paper. <laughs> yes. I don't particularly long for those days back. <laughs> but you see, you tried very, very hard on the first page of a new exercise book yes. not to make any mistakes and, and not to have any blots. And I must admit, I can remember at least once when, unfortunately, I, I did make a blot on the first page. What do you think I did? I tore the page out and started with a new clean page. And in a sense, it's a bit like that. God needs to tear out the page. Yes. <laughs> so, turning over a new leaf today won't eradicate yesterday's sin. No one can be righteous in God's sight by trying to do better by keeping the law. We've all sinned. We're all separated from God. There's nothing we can do. We all need a saviour. And that's why Jesus died. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He died on a cross to reconcile our sinners to God. He did this by offering himself as a sacrifice to God. There are quotes from John 1 and Colossians 1 and Ephesians 5. He died in our place. Because of our sin, we should die. Instead, Christ has died for us. He took the punishment for us. Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions. Oh, thank you, Jesus. He suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. So that we needn't be separated. He wanted to bring us to God. The righteous suffered for us who are unrighteous. 1 Peter 3.18 We deserve to die because of our sin, but because he loved us, he came and died in our place so that we could have eternal life. Oh, hallelujah. So why did Jesus have to suffer and die? So that we could be saved. But what must we do? Well, the first thing we have to do and it's not actually something we do, but God does for us, but we have to let him do it for us. Another must. You must be born again. Listen to what Jesus once said to a very religious man called Nicodemus. I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Of course, Jesus wasn't talking about physical birth. He was talking about a spiritual birth where God so completely changes us that we become a new person. Oh, same body, same face. Yes, same personality in many, many ways. But in many ways, totally new. Because we've been cleaned up. And this happens when we repent of our sin. We're truly sorry. And we trust Jesus for forgiveness, relying on the fact that he's already taken the punishment for us when he died on the cross. The Bible also calls this being saved, and it's important because it's the only way to get to heaven. And I know that most of you, probably all of you listening to me, know all that already, but there could just be someone listening who didn't know, and I want you to know you need a saviour. Jesus is that saviour. But to be saved, you must be born again. Jesus said, I am the way. No one comes to the Father, to God, except by me. And Peter said, salvation is found in no one else. 
other than Jesus. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. You don't have to be saved. But if you're going to be saved, you must be saved by Jesus. Because he is the only one who can save you from your sin. And that is why we come to another must. The gospel must be preached. It must. Mark 4, 43 Jesus said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom because that's why I was sent. John 9, 4, as long as it's day, we must do the work of him who sent me. I had to check that because my memory of it from the old authorised version is, as long as it is in day, I am, sorry, as long as, it is, as long as it is day, I must do the work of him who sent me. But the more modern versions say we must do. So I checked it out in the Greek, and the Greek actually is we. Interesting. Jesus is involving his disciples in doing the good works. The good works are indeed the proclamation of the gospel with signs and wonders and all these other things. We must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. There will be a time when it is too late. Too late to be saved. Too late to preach the gospel to those who need to be saved. And in Mark 13, 10, Jesus said that before he came, comes again, the gospel must be preached to all nations. How seriously are we taking the must of preaching the gospel? But that brings me, finally, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection chapter, and two more musts. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 22 to 25. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, all power and authority. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. He must reign. Aren't you glad about that? <laughs> there is an inevitability about his reign. Yeah. Actually, he's reigning now. He must reign of logical necessity. Who is he? He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He must reign. And he must reign by divine irrevocable decree. God has said, sit at my right hand until I make your foes your footstool. Oh, yes. Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is reigning now. And the day will come when every knee will bow at his name and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But I can't just leave those couple of verses without just mentioning the main point that Paul is making here, that Christ's resurrection guarantees ours. <laughs> As in Adam, all die. We all sinned like Adam sinned. And as a result, we all die. But if we're in Christ, 
we will all be made alive. Each in his own turn. Christ the first fruits. And then when he comes, those who belong to him. Do you belong to Christ? If you belong to Christ, if you've given your life to him, if you are born again, oh, wow. You too will be raised. What a glorious, glorious assurance that is at someone's funeral. Hallelujah. The last four weeks I've been rejoicing in that truth in a very special way. But now another must, and this is the end. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 53. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Hmm. So incidentally, you don't need to worry whether you're buried or cremated because mm -hmm. flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God anyway. Mm -hmm. Nor does the perishable, this body, inherit the imperishable. This body isn't going to heaven. Listen, I tell you a mystery, and this <coughs> is a bit of a mystery. But just because it's a mystery doesn't mean it isn't true. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. That means we won't all die because Jesus is coming again at some point and there will be a generation of Christians, very possibly this one, who will not sleep, who will not die, but who will have to be changed interesting we will not all sleep but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound oh I just have to tell you one or two of you came to the cremation service and you'll know that at the end I went to the coffin and placed my hand on it and I said until the trumpet sounds oh. hallelujah Amen. it's only till the trumpet sounds that he's coming again the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible <laughs> I've lost my place oh. <laughs> For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For here's the must. For the perishable, this body, must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal must clothe itself with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up Hallelujah. in victory. Hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you for clapping, Jesus, but I've not quite finished. <laughs> he must reign. This mortal must put on immortality. Here's an awesome thought. If you know Jesus, your immortality is as certain as his reign. Wow. God bless you. Amen.